local landowner uh, came to the biology department at Stanford and was reporting finding all of these malformed frogs uh, on his property. And in some of the ponds, actually more than 25% of the frogs that were emerging showed these really wicked deformities. And this had just become a huge national issue. And there was a lot of general interest in just what was going on to cause these deformed frogs. This seemed like a, an intriguing applied problem, an environmental murder mystery, if you will. Why were these frogs showing up with all these malformations? And what were the implications? What did this mean for amphibian population persistence? I teamed up with a friend and colleague, Kevin Lundy, and we began trying to piece together what the most likely causes were or were not. And by surveying lots of ponds across the landscape, uh, and by studying these things very intensively in the laboratory, we were able to start to build evidence that one of the big causes was in fact infection by a, a trematode flatworm. So here we are at one of our typical study sites, and what happens in a pond such as this is you have a huge community of freshwater snails. And these snails serve as the, as the first host for the parasite. Every night, each of those snails can produce thousands, sometimes tens of thousands, of these tiny microscopic parasites. And those parasites are basically swimming throughout this pond looking for amphibians, looking for tadpoles. And once they find a tadpole, they'll burrow into the areas where the tadpole's limbs are just starting to grow, and they'll form a cyst. They're waiting for the tadpole to eventually metamorphose. It turns into a frog. And then those frogs come onto land. And these deformed frogs, in particular, are going to be really easy pickings for the birds. Then those birds themselves become infected. Now, once infected, the bird could, could basically release parasite eggs back into this pond through its own feces. Or the bird might fly out to any number of other ponds in the area and release the parasite into those ponds as well. And the idea that this, this tiny microscopic worm can actually manipulate all of these other species in an ecosystem to its own benefit is humbling and fascinating at the same time. So with that power of being able to link this in the field, we really moved on to the, the next step in the puzzle. And that step was trying to understand how is it that different forms of environmental change can influence how much parasites we get at one pond as opposed to another. So for example, in our current study, if we find a link between nutrient runoff, say coming from fertilizers or from cows, for example, and the presence or the abundance of this parasite, because we've already built this up into an experimental system, we can bring that back into the laboratory and we can test that idea explicitly. We can alter the levels of nutrients and see how that affects the parasite and then how that in turn affects the levels of deformities in these frogs. I really want to understand how we manage the landscape in such a way as to reduce the types of diseases that can affect and can kill amphibians. And if we can figure out how to manage the land in such a way that, that we can all live together without causing increased amounts of diseases in our wildlife, I think that has enormous applied benefit for keeping these populations viable uh, for generations to come.